author of the books The Four Horsemen and Big Gold from MidAtlanticGateway.com, Dick Bourne. Uh, I don't enjoy those that much. I do enjoy the um, shows where Tony and Conrad talk about certain wrestlers or certain time periods, certain angles, and so forth. That's uh, those shows are the ones I enjoy, of course, and I greatly appreciate Tony and Conrad using uh, my book, uh, The Four Horsemen, to uh, sort of as a guide for those episodes. Let me freestyle, you know, the reason I, where I was going with this was there's lots of, you know, conspiracy theories in wrestling, as you know. No, oh, but. And, and one of the conspiracies was. Hey, the uh, flair was gaining such popularity as a baby face and dusty wanted to keep himself as the prime baby, baby face position. So let's turn flair. So they're not competing for the top baby face spot. And instead dusty can work with flair as a top heel. Yeah. Um, what say you, is that just dusty being a smart booker as uh, wearing a booker hat or is that dusty, the wrestler protecting the spot? That's a combination of both. Well, that's fair. I mean, I, I mean, it is. Uh, you know, Dusty had it. Dusty had a, a big ego, uh, but Dusty Man could could talk uh, and could do some things that were wonderful, and uh, and had the book. The old the old adage back then was guys who had the book would always put themselves in the top spot because they knew in their mind what they wanted, and it was better for them to do it than to tell someone else how to do it. Uh, that was part of Dusty's thinking back then, uh, right or wrong. But uh, I think it's yeah, I think it's a combination of both. It's a combination of Dusty wanting to be the top babyface, and Dusty knowing that if he's going to have as the top babyface, if you're going to have someone good to work with, it would have to be Ric Flair because Flair could work, and Flair in the ring could make guys who couldn't work as well as him look good. Hell, I saw, I saw matches with Ric Flair and the Junkyard Dog. And this is, you know, later on in the early 90s. And Flair did the best he could with JYD, who, as we all know, was, was not a good worker. But Flair made him look like something. Uh, and Dusty knew that. So I think Dusty wanted to get somebody in the ring with him that could work and had a great presence. And that's why... He always paired himself with a flair. Not always, but many times did. Straight from the uh, new horseman book, flair had just defeated Nikita Koloff inside a steel cage to successfully defend the NWA world championship. Ivan Koloff had entered the cage and both of the Russians were ganging up on flair. Suddenly Rhodes entered the cage to a huge ovation to help flair once again. And he cleared the ring of the Russians. Flair seemed furious. Moments later, the Andersons entered the cage and attacked Rhodes. If fans thought for a moment that Flair might return the favor and lend a hand to Dusty, they soon learned otherwise. The Andersons locked the cage door and held Rhodes down to the mat as Flair came off the top rope on his leg, breaking his ankle. The babyface locker room emptied as Magnum T.A., Ricky Morton, Robert Gibson, and Terry Taylor all tried to scale the cage walls, but the Andersons kept knocking them down. The Omni crowd began to riot. With that crazy scene in the Omni, the seeds were sown for what would become the battle of the horsemen versus Dusty Rhodes for the next several years. Um, you were there. What was it? Yeah. Uh, what was it like that night in the Omni? This is one of those iconic scenes that we see as fans in 2017 and think, boy, it'll never be like that again. Yeah, it was chaos. And I remember uh, that he was concerned for his safety leaving the, the ring that night. Uh, we had... Uh, one of our hot spots, the Omni, just like Greensboro, uh, and one of the great angles, and the fact that they were in the steel cage and nobody could hit, get in to help him out, even made the situation even more uh, urgent. Uh, I, rem I remember that being legitimate heat, legitimate heat that you'll never see again. Well, uh, that legitimate heat, you know, would would build for a lot um, and, and a long time because this would be one of the all-time iconic feuds and, as we said, would go for years and years. So soon after this uh, massacre in the cage, uh, Tully Blanchard becomes closely aligned with the Andersons and he had spent the first half of 85 battling Rhodes over the TV title and then the second half with Magnum TA over the U.S. title. 
Uh, now there's four of them and baby doll is at Tully's side. And we would begin to see, um, these guys appear on each other's interviews. And this is the first time we'd really kind of seen this. Uh, Tully began teaming regularly with the Andersons in some six, ta- six man tag matches across the country as well. Uh, how friendly were these guys behind the scenes during this time? Was there some sort of formal introduction as to, Hey, we're going to start pairing you guys together. Or did it just kind of organically happen to the best of your recollection? Uh, it organically happened. You D- dusty had a pretty good idea on what could end a show and what would get the fans talking. And you'll notice on some of these shows back then, flair came out more than once and Tully would come out more than once. And then they would come out together. And there was a lot of impromptu, those guys joining each other uh, at the set together. As we formatted the show out, there were a lot of times that I didn't see Tully, Rick, and Arn together. I just saw them that maybe Tully was going to come out. But Flair and Arn would join him because in the back they were probably talking to Dusty about this and they would come up with things on the fly. How uh, friendly were these guys behind the scenes? Is this... You know, before they're really officially formed here, were they already behind the scenes traveling buddies? I mean, we hear a lot of times that, you know, even today guys ride together. Um, were these guys kind of riding buddies? Did they party together? What was that dynamic like? Rick Flair, Ole, uh, and Tully Blanchard and Arn Anderson and JJ. And <laughs> sometimes me, when I was on the road, travel together. Not saying I'm a horseman. Even before they were originally formed as the horsemen, they were traveling buddies. Yes. Okay. Well, there you go. Oli, Oli did not travel with them. I see. Oli had a completely different lifestyle, a completely old school way of doing things. And I think Oli traveled on his own. Uh, he didn't want to get involved in any of that. Uh, so uh, well, those guys traveled together, and he was a separate. So they got along, and, and Ole got along with them. But there was a bit, there was there was quite a separation between Ole and the rest of the guys. Do you have any good uh, examples or stories you can share with us about how that dynamic worked with Ole kind of being on his own? I just know Ole at a lot of times would say, as as Flair would do his stuff and do his interviews, and we would be on the road. I remember Ole saying, "I'm not getting involved in that shit at all." He would tell me that Oli and I had Oli was a great conversationalist. You could sit down and talk to Oli Anderson for hours about anything. He loved to talk about money. <laughs> he loved to talk about the stock market, uh, but he could sit down and talk to him for hours about anything. But when you talked about flair and those guys, it's, he didn't never create, never criticize what they did on camera within the ring. But he would always like, I'm not doing that shit as far as going on the road with them and drinking and partying. So he was very much against that and very opposed to it. And I guess maybe he didn't appreciate it. So he didn't party. Did he dilly dally? No. If he did, that was if if he did, that was ultra kayfabe. So Arn, Arn didn't like, or Ole didn't like, uh, alcohol or women. And he was a horseman. It's no wonder they kicked his ass out. <laughs> I uh, know. It, he, he, he may have secretly liked both. Uh, but, uh, it, I mean, Ole just showed up, right? I mean, we would be around and then Ole would show up not being with the other guys. There may have been sometimes because of need and because of, uh, just at the right time that Ole would hop into a car and go to a town with him. But Ole never went to the bar. Ole uh, never went out to dinner. And I don't know why he didn't, because Flair always picked up the tab. And Ole was so fucking tight that he would love that. Well, I'll tell you what. You could tell Ole was tight because he used to wear those T-shirts on TV that were just yeah. iron-on letters. That My favorite was the one that said, damn, I am good. I'm a big fan of that one. Uh, and he wore those, wore those burgundy trunks. And those boots with the gold stripes on it that he wore from the 60s, I guess. 